Objection number seven. Quote, Christ himself both paid tribute and commanded his disciples to pay it, and that even to Caesar. Matthew 17, verse 27, and Matthew 22, verse 21. Was not this an acknowledgment of his authority? Unquote. Answer. Simple payment of tribute never was considered as any homologation of the authority imposing it. It may be given to the worst of tyrants, if not demanded as a tessera of loyalty. We might ask here, do the people of the United States homologate the authority of the day of Algerius for conscience sake? Or, excuse me, or for conscience sake, recognize him as their legitimate ruler when they pay their annual tribute to the haughty Mussulman? Do they think that the day has any moral right to demand such a thing? Do they not rather go upon the principle that it is better to give a part to save the remainder than, by withholding, lose all? Such a course of conduct may be prudent and innocent with any band of robbers. The allegation brought from Matthew 17, verse 27, is evidently unfounded. See the passage. The best commentators consider the tribute here mentioned to be a temple money, the ransom of the soul spoken of, Exodus 30, verses 12 and 13. That this was the case will appear evident first, because the piece of money found in the fish's mouth is allowed by the best critics to be equaled in value to two half shekels, one for Christ and the other for Peter. And secondly, from the argument by which our Lord pleads exemption, namely, from the example of the kings of the earth, quote, What thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute, of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free, unquote. Here we find by the example of earthly kings, Christ was free. How was he free? By being the son to the king to whom the tribes belonged. Who was this king? It could not be Caesar. Was Christ Caesar's son? No. For had he been Caesar's son, it must have been either by natural generation, adoption, or citizenship. None of all these was the case. And even though the last had taken place, which is the only pl plausible supposition, though false, it would not have procured this immunity because citizenship did not exempt from tribute. But Jesus was the son of the God of heaven, that king to whom the tribute Belong, uh, that king to whom this tribute belonged. Hence he says, quote, notwithstanding, unquote. That is, though I am free by the relation of sonship, etc. The other allegation brought from Matthew 22, verse 21, quote, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, unquote, is equally unfounded. It is abundantly evident from the passage that the question was intended to ensnare the Lord Jesus Christ, answer as he would. It was proposed by the Herodians and Pharisees, those votaries for Roman domination, and these, the sticklers for Jewish immunities. Had he said, quote, give it to Caesar, unquote, the Pharisees ever ready to accuse him would have represented him to the people as an enemy to their ancient privileges. Had he said, quote, don't give it, unquote, the Herodians would have represented him to Herod as an enemy to the government of Caesar. In the 15th verse, we are expressly told they came to him with a view to, quote, entangle him in his talk, Unquote. But he, quote, knowing their craftiness, unquote, split their dilemma and left their question undecided. He on several other occasions thus baffled his adversaries, as in John 8, verses 4 and 12, in the case of the woman taken in adultery, and in Luke 12, verse 14, when application was made to him concerning the settlement of the earthly inheritance. It is objected here by some, quote, that this explanation of our Savior's answer represents the Lord as shunning to declare the whole counsel of God, giving no answer in a case respecting sin and duty, unquote. The inference is false. They were not without information on this very subject. They had the law and the prophets. The Lord Jesus Christ had given specific directions concerning the character of lawful rulers. Deuteronomy 17, verse 15, to whom it was lawful to pay tribute for conscience sake. But it was not information they wanted, but to ensnare him. Let him answer as he would, as has already been shown. If silence or refusing to answer in every case, even in matters respecting sin and duty, let the design of the quest, uh, excuse me, let the design of the querist be what it will, be accounted criminal. In what point of light will the objector view the Lord Jesus Christ when he finds him actually refusing to answer a question respecting sin and duty in the case of his own authority? Mark 11 verses 27 and 33. Quote, Neither do I tell you, says he, by what authority I do these things. Unquote. 
It would be well if men would consider the awful consequences of some of their objections before they make them. But, supposing that Christ, in both the instances alluded to, had commanded tribute to be paid to Caesar, what does it prove? Unless he commanded it to be paid as a tessera of loyalty, it proves no more the morality of Caesar's right than a minister of the gospel advising one of his hearers to give the robber part of his property to secure the remainder would that the minister considered the robber morally entitled to it. Objection number eight. Quote, but you make use of the money which receives its currency from their sanction, and you support them by paying tribute. Why not swear allegiance, hold offices, etc.? Unquote. Answer. We make use of the money, to be sure. But when we give an equivalent for it, by industry or otherwise, it is our own property, and another man stamping his name upon our coats is no reason why we should throw them away. It must be granted also that we do support them by paying tribute, etc. So do, uh, so do we the robber, unto whom we give a part to save the remainder. But will it therefore follow that I may legally swear allegiance to him, or become one of his officers in the business of robbery and plunder? Objection 9. Quote, you swear oaths administered by them and hold deeds of land, etc., whose validity rests entirely on their sanction, unquote. Answer. Administration is not essential to an oath. It is no part of it. An oath is a solemn appeal to God in which we call him to witness the truth of what we assert or promise and to be an avenger in case of perjury. Administration is nothing more than arranging the matter and expression of the oath into due form. This may be done either by the person himself who swears or proposed by another, and, if in itself equitable, may be accept, excuse me, may be adopted by the juror, be the proposer whomsoever he may. Should a robber meet me on the highway, and, finding that I had no money, put his bayonet to my breast, and should it appear evidently that he intended to kill me unless I would solemnly engage to take or send him a certain sum of money in a given time, say, fifty dollars, ought I not to comply? If I do, the oath is the result of mutual stipulation, which existing circumstances rendered eligible. It seems to me immaterial whether the overture originates with him or with me. In either case, I consider it lawful to give fifty dollars to save my life. Would swearing this oath, if proposed by the robber, be any recognition of his right to my property? Where would be the difference, should my life be saved, by another coming under similar engagements for me with my consent? Whatever difference there is between this illustration and appearing in common courts of justice to plead or be impleaded where oaths are necessary to a decision is in favor of the position contended for, inasmuch as the persons before whom the affair is transacted are considered as possessing honor and respectability. With respect to the other allegation, that is, quote, the holding land by tenures whose validity depends upon their sanction, unquote, it is also unfounded. Does bargaining with a man for any article, in all cases, recognize the morality of the means whereby he became possessed of the said article? If it does so, then should any foreign power conquer America, which God forbid, and declare all ten years of land null and void, which did not proceed from the new order of things, it would be criminal to hold them thus, and so the land must be vacated, and its planters flee somewhere else for an asylum. But supposing they found things similar, Wherever they go, must they leave this world altogether? They must neither eat nor drink of the produce of the land held by this immoral tenure, for by the hypothesis the cultivator holds it by an immoral tenure, and so no bargain should be made with him, more than with the power from which the deed originally issues. Might I not rent a room of my own house, which a man has deprived me of and now holds legally, though by an immoral tenure, without thereby recognizing the morality of his right? If I may rent it, may I not give an article in writing securing the payment to him and the tenure to me? If I may do so with one room, may I not do so with the whole house and tenement thereunto belonging? If I may rent the whole, may I not also purchase it, putting the bargain under similar securities as above mentioned? If this be lawful, how can the case under consideration be unlawful?' 